John chapter 3. We'll begin reading here at verse 22. I'll read to verse 24, and we'll get into our study. John chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. John writes, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now, John also was baptized in Anan near Salem, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Now, remember in the previous verses of John chapter 3, Jesus had presented the way of salvation to a man by the name of of Nicodemus. And we saw that Nicodemus was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was a religious leader, the teacher of Israel. And as Jesus was speaking to him, Jesus instructed him concerning the necessity of being born again. And Jesus had made it clear to him that without new birth, there was no hope for Nicodemus to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, Nicodemus's religious practices, his biblical knowledge were simply not enough. And so Jesus told him that there needed to be not just religious ideas and philosophy and practice, but you need something that is brand new. You need an entirely new life. Even though his religious devotion was commendable, he needed more than good works. Jesus made it clear, you need a new nature. And Jesus said, and I can make that possible. Now, in the book of Galatians, in chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, Paul said, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. See, so neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, religious practices and uh, the things that are related ritually to religious faith, Those aren't the things that actually count. What counts, he says, is a new nature. That's why Paul told us that if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, he said, all things are become new. He needs a new nature. And that's what Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus about. And so as he did so in the first portion of chapter 3, John now returns to the ministry of another man named John, a man by the name of John the Baptist. Now, the events that he records for us that we'll be looking at are taking place outside of the city of Jerusalem. It's in the south in Judea. Notice how it begins in verse 32, how he says, There he remained with them and baptized. He remained with them. The word remain means to pass the time together or spend time. In other words, Jesus was using this time to develop his relationship with his disciples. He remained with them so that he might pour into them. Though they were his followers, they needed to understand simply who he is. They needed to connect deeply with him. They needed to know him as rabbi and mentor. And the best way for this to occur was for them and for us to spend time with him. I think there are a lot of people who are religiously busy, who are not spending time with Jesus. They do a lot for him, at least in his name they do a lot. But they're so busy that they don't have quiet and personal time with him. And that's one of the reasons why people, reasons why people burn out. That's one of the reasons why people say, I can't do this any longer, I need to take a break. It's because they're pouring themselves out constantly, but they're not spending time in prayer and devotion to the Lord. And Jesus wants us to spend time with him. And that's what he did. That's how he mentored people. Every couple of weeks here in this church, I have a group of men that I spend uh, almost two hours with after second service, every couple of weeks. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to use the model of Christ to spend time with the men, to answer their questions, to speak biblically to them and do those kinds of things. And that's what the Lord did. In Mark 3, 14, Uh, Mark said that Jesus appointed 12 that they might be with him. And that's the way a rabbi would mentor his disciples. You see, spending time with them was part of their training. They couldn't become what they were intended to be without spending this kind of time with him. And so he was doing this. He was spending time with them, and he was teaching them. 
He would teach them things that were meant just for them. He would do works that only they really would see. And you can read your gospel and you'll see that. Because there'll be times when they speak to him, they'll say, now you're, now you're speaking plainly. Or he would take them aside and explain a parable to them and help them to understand it. Or they see the transfiguration. Not everybody saw that. Only certain disciples saw that. And so that's what he's doing here. He's spending time with them. He's teaching them things they need to know. He's, he's revealing things of himself that they need to know. And he's spending this time with them to develop them. And it says in verse 22 that he remained with them and he baptized. Now, when it says he remained with them and baptized, all you need to do is look at chapter 4, verse 2. And that verse makes it clear that Jesus wasn't the one baptizing people personally. His disciples were doing the baptizing. But what they did by his authority and his command was attributed to him. And so this is taking place now, this baptism and all. And verse 23, it says, John also was baptizing in Anan near Salem because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. Now, the exact location is unknown. It is located somewhere in the south. But when we go to Israel, we will go to a place called Kassar al-Yahud. It's just uh, there in the south outside of Jerusalem. And there are those, many, who believe that that may very well be the traditional baptismal site or what this passage is referring to. But notice in verse 23 how it says, he was baptized in an Elam, rather Anan, near Salem. And so the word Anan means springs. When it speaks of much water, that speaks of springs of water. And so there he is at these springs of water baptizing, and he's continuing his ministry. And uh, verse 24 tells us, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Briefly, he had not yet been thrown into prison. Why was he thrown into prison? For preaching. For preaching to Herod. And saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. Philip, the brother of Herod, ha had a beautiful wife named Herodias. And Philip had gone to Rome and had visited, and while there had started an affair with, rather Herod had started an affair with Philip's wife, Herodias, and brought her back and treated her as if she was his wife. But uh, it's interesting when this is spoken of in Matthew 14, it's interesting how it says that Herod was upset at John because he said to him, it is unlawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. And Herodias is never referred to as uh, Herod's wife. She is referred to as his brother Philip's wife. And so John the Baptist didn't mince words. He wasn't a man who would be on many of these Christian TV programs today because he spoke the truth in a powerful way. He, he spoke the truth in a way that was unmistakable. He spoke truth to power. And power doesn't want to hear truth. I really think that we're living in a time when pastors need to, when given opportunity, we need to speak the truth to those in power when given opportunity. Not to say that I should candidate somehow to speak into the ear of the president. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, when a minister has opportunity to speak to power, or speak at any time. They ought to speak the truth in a way that is not a compromising, almost apologetic thing. And let me give you something that will offend somebody, at least one. If I don't do at least one offend, offense, then I'm not doing my job. Um, so there was a call to the churches to pray for the president this weekend. All of you probably heard of it, right? If you didn't, if I were here, you would have. Um, I'm hoping you did. I would have prayed for our president. I pray for the president. Why? We're commanded to pray for those in authority. That's what the Bible teaches, right? That's what the Bible teaches, pray for those in authority. And that's what we do. We're not praying because he's Republican, or we're not praying because he's Democrat, independent, whatever. We're, that's not what we're praying. We're praying so that we might have peace, live in peace, and that God might somehow break through this 
this evil land that we live in and do a work that gives to us more opportunity to preach his, his gospel. It's a wise thing to pray for those in authority that we might live peaceable lives. And that's what Paul told Timothy that we ought to do. There's nothing wrong with doing that. So the President Trump, and I know people don't like him, and you ought to, man, in Europe, I have to tell you, I came back loving him more than ever before, and I'll tell you why. They hate him in Europe. They really do. I mean, Marie and I, my wife and I, were watching the news yesterday, and I'm telling you, you know, it's bad enough to hear these British people that were on, on the news, they were being interviewed on the street and all, what do you think about Trump? Oh, he's this, and he's evil, and he's... These people, they, they don't know this man from... From Adam and making these judgments uh, that's bad enough by itself but an American was was on TV saying how much this man is despicable and and there's the, the finally the interviewer to this American artist said to him isn't there a single thing good about that man he said not a single thing he's a misogynist he's homophobic he's a racist He's just giving all of CNN's, you know, speaking points. And as I'm listening to that, I got really upset. And I'm apolitical in many ways. Most of you know that. You know, I'm, I don't tell you who to vote for. I will tell you who I vote for, but vote for who, who you will and then pay the penalty. But, um, <laughs> I like the fact that the remains of our Korean War veterans were brought home. I like that. I like the fact that African Americans and Hispanic Americans are getting jobs. I like that. I like an economy that's growing. I like that. I like the idea that the president, though you may or may not like him, it's up to you. Uh, you're supposed to be praying for him anyway, but I like the fact that he tells people we need to read the Bible, that he appoints conservative judges and justices. That was a big issue to me. I like that. Uh, there's a lot that I like. There are a lot, a lot of things I don't like. You won't hear the things they don't like. I want to stay on the things I like. But it really bothered me to see this American trashing our president. I just, we can have family squabbles, but keep those squabbles in the four walls of your house. Don't take them internationally and make the president of the United States look like a bumbling fool. He does a good job on his own. We, <laughs> But actually, I, I have a love for the man because he's doing things that I think need to be done. And I, and I have a love for him as a man. And, and, and I want God to, to touch his heart. That, why wouldn't we want God to touch? Listen, I was no fan of, any, uh, of Obama. Everybody in this church knew that. If you didn't, let me say it. I was no fan of his. I didn't vote for him either time. And I could tell you why, but I won't. Just I didn't. But... I'll tell you why. No, I didn't. <laughs> but when given an opportunity, we need to speak the truth to power. And John did that. John did that to Herod. And when John did that to Herod, it got Herodias, Herod's the woman he was living with, got Herodias angry. And she was looking for a convenient time to deal with John. And that day came. It was Herod's birthday. He had all his officers, various political people, at a birthday party. And Herodias' daughter danced just a very sexually salacious dance. And it got him excited. And he began to, bo he began to say, I'll give you up to half my kingdom, making this promise to this girl. So she runs off to her mom and says, what should I ask for? He says, I can have anything up to half the kingdom. What should I ask for? And that was Herodias' chance, she says. I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Can you imagine? See, we're very genteel. We Americans can't imagine. I can't imagine the evil of such a request to behead a man, take his head and place it on a silver plate and to bring, can, can you 
fathom that, the evil of such a request, yet for his drunken oath and for the sake of his drunken oath and for the sake of the soldiers and all that were around him, though he didn't want to do it, he had it done. John the Baptist. There is a, uh, a price, listen carefully, I'll say this briefly, but it's important. There's a price that we, we will pay for loving Jesus. And there are a whole lot of people who are afraid to pay that price. So they compromise. They don't ever speak the truth. They keep it to themselves. They actually get angry when the truth is spoken. Isn't that amazing? But it's true. They actually get angry. When I was in Germany, I was teaching, and I shared something about homosexuality, and boom, woman gets up and marches out because she has been brainwashed into believing that a sexual sin, like homosexuality, is approved of by God. She's in church listening to a Bible study. But the minute something is said that she disagrees with, and you have to ask, where did you come to your point of disagreement? Is it in Scripture somewhere? Can you point to me a Bible verse or several that teach me that homosexuality is acceptable to God? You can be a homosexual and go to heaven. Can you show me Scripture that says that? No, it's just what I feel. Well, your feelings don't count, and they don't matter. What matters is God's Word. And that's what preachers are supposed to do, is preach the Word of God. That's what we're called to do. And people don't like to hear it. And the pastor walks up and he says, well, you got one person mad today. I said, listen, in my church, I usually see more than one. I actually thought I was doing good. <laughs> yeah, I did. It's true. So what happened? Well, he had not yet been thrown into prison. That gives us the timeline. Ultimately, he was and lost his head. So in verse 25, then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he's baptizing, and all are coming to him. So there's this dispute, an argument, and it, it is, it's related to purification. So John's men were questioned about his baptism and the baptism Jesus' men performed, and, and the dispute upset John's disciples. Now, it may be that they feel that uh, John the Baptist is being disrespected because notice in verse 26, it says they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, notice how they say this, he who is with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he's baptizing, they're all coming to him. So it sounds as if they are upset because they think he's disrespected. You started first, you should be given greater honor. As a matter of fact, John, you baptized Jesus. Now, this kind of thing can happen between members of differing churches. My church is better than your church. My pastor is better than your pastor. That's called sectarianism. It's the fruit of what is called carnal comparison. It's interesting, but the Apostle Paul had to deal with this kind of mentality because it existed in the church of Corinth. And the church there in the city of Corinth had actually begun to divide over their favorite teachers. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, Paul said, Now I say this, that each of you says, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. They were dividing over their favorite teachers and all. So as a minister of the gospel, Paul would not have anything to do with this carnality. And Paul made it clear that he was simply a minister and nothing else. Later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he said it like this, verses 2 through 4. He said to them, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? When you begin to argue, oh, this guy is more special than that guy, he says, that's just carnality. So notice how he receives this and handles this question. Notice at verse 27, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. 
you yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. A man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. Striving for preeminence, striving for fame, striving for ministry greatness is futile. It's been rightly said there are few things as unattractive as a pride-filled minister. Prominence in the kingdom of God is not to be sought after. Prominence is actually a place you're, you are put into by God himself because it's God who decides whom he will use and it is God who decides to what degree he will use them. It's like what it says in Psalm 75, verses 6 and 7. Exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. God is the one who puts a person in the place that he strategically intends him to serve in. There are young pastors today and young want-to-be pastors today who are being invited to all kinds of uh, seminars and conferences where they can come and learn how to fill the pews with people. And there are promises being made to these young men that if they will use the methodology that this individual wants to sell to them, in the conference, that they will one day go from 50 people to 100 people to 200 to 400. And uh, they're almost guaranteeing that they can have churches that are filled. But here's the thing. Any man who wants to fill the pew and is, is not concerned with how he does it shouldn't be occupying the pulpit. He shouldn't be occupying the pulpit because he's trying to become great based on the number of people who show up the things he does. And when I began this ministry, and I'll say it quickly, but when I began this ministry uh, back in July of 1981, we, we didn't begin the church so we would be a, a large church. We began the church because I wanted people to know Jesus Christ. And that's really what you're supposed to do, is raise people up in the things of the Lord. And you, as a minister, and John knew this, this is what he's referring to, that, that ministry begins and ends with God. It's John's responsibility to be faithful to what God has placed him in to do. John doesn't determine uh, what he's to do. He obeys God and does what God commands. And John was humble. And John was aware of who he was. And he also was aware of who he was serving. And his humility safeguarded him from seeking glory in ministry, a ministry, by the way, he was entrusted with. Remember what he had said earlier when asked who he was and why he was baptizing in John chapter 1, verses 26 and 27? John said, I baptize with water. There stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. A genuine minister of the gospel realizes who they are and what they are. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. And the most valuable vessel is always going to be the broken one because the broken vessel ministers out of brokenness. And John was a man who was being used mightily by the Lord. And he wanted to make sure that they understood this so a man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. But he goes on in verse 28, you yourselves bear me witness that I said I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. And so he says in verse 28, you bear witness of me, I said, I'm not the Christ. I've been sent before him. 
Remember in John 1 verse 20 how he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. And in John 1 23, how he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. So he wasn't seeking for himself to be known. He wanted to make Jesus known. Notice verse 29 when it speaks of the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. It's the bridegroom's friend, his, his uh, best man, the friend of the bridegroom stands and hears him rejoicing greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, the joy of mine is fulfilled. In other words, I have no rivalry for the affection of the bride. You know, can you picture that? A best man there trying to take off with the bride at the wedding, you know, just giving her those looks, you know, and whispering. Yada. He says, I'm not that way. I'm not trying to steal the affection of the bride. Listen, and I'll make this. This is something I speak to pastors, and it, it, I may not be able to clarify it in a general community. If I were speaking to pastors, I would be saying to pastors, your job is to get out of the way so that Jesus can be seen. And when people begin to say, oh, I have the greatest pastor, well, a pastor who doesn't point to the master is going to have a disaster. <laughs> you can write that down, put it in David's <laughs> quotes. But it's true. It is the pastor's obligation and calling to direct people to Jesus Christ. John said, I am not battling for the affection of the bride. Who is the bride? The church. Who is the groom? Jesus Christ. What is his role? I'm the best man. I rejoice to hear the voice of the bridegroom. I'm not here battling for the affection of people. One of the problems the church has today is pastors who are so hungry to hear the church tell them how good they are and how important they are and how wise they are as they begin to steal glory from God. It's a very dangerous place to be because God says, I'm the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I give to no one else, neither my praise to graven images. Now, he is a jealous God. And so it's very important for all ministers to realize that he gets all the glory. John is teaching us that. John is teaching us that. Are you jealous for my sake? I already told you who I am. I'm the best man. I'm not the groom. I'm here preparing the way for him. Why? Because it's the people I am pointing to this man, to this Messiah. These are the ones. They need him. I, they don't need me. I'm just the forerunner. He's the real deal. I have no rivalry for the affection of the bride. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 2, Paul said it like this. He said, I'm jealous for you with godly jealousy. I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And then he says, and this is so powerful, he must increase, but I must decrease. He must increase. I must decrease. You see, it's difficult gathering people who are willing to follow your lead. Yet it can be even more difficult to give them up. And some leaders desire attention, and in doing so, draw it away from Jesus. When that minister becomes more important than, than Christ and his word and his spirit, it's not a good thing. You know, sometimes people, when they hear that their pastor is not going to be in church on Sunday, he's not going to be teaching, sometimes they don't come to church. They'll go do something else, go visit somewhere else. It's really not a healthy thing, is it? Because I would hope in this fellowship, I would hope, I would hope all of us know enough now to say, you know, what matters is God's word. What really matters is the presence of the Holy Spirit and an encouragement to follow Christ. And I, I appreciate as a pastor, I appreciate the love of my congregation. Some in this congregation are very warm to me, and I appreciate that very much. I really do. I, I really do. And I love it in the sense that, that there's this love for me, and I appreciate it deeply. But I would prefer a greater love for Christ, for that this church would love Jesus more. And that, that, that's the truth. You know, that, 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 that's the truth. See, see, one, one day, one day, and I'll say this briefly again. I always say I'll say this briefly and then go on for a while. But anyway, um, 
One of these days, and, and should the Lord tarry, one of these days, I'll have my last sermon here. I know that. There'll be one day that happens. I've been here a long time, 38 years. You know, and I'm growing older. I know that, and that's okay. I like it. I have a problem growing older. I'm grateful I am. Every day I'm grateful for it. Thank God for it. But one of these days, the Lord's going to say, I'm going to bring in some young guy who can handle it, and I'm going to kiss you goodbye. And that's going to happen. But I want you so prepared so that when the word goes forth from the new pastor of this church, that you just keep moving forward for Jesus Christ. That's what pastors are supposed to do, is just to step out of the way so Jesus can take you further. And that, to me, is a real important thing in my life. And the older I get, the more I realize it. I get it. I do. But whoever comes in here, there's going to be an important thing. I'll say it right now. They have to love the Lord Jesus Christ with all of their heart. They have to love his word. They have to walk in his spirit. But they have to love you. Because I would not hand my church to anybody who didn't love you. That, to me, matters. He needs to love you. I'm serious. Because I never did. But anyway, <laughs> he must increase, I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. So Jesus is the one who's from above. He is superior to all things that are of the earth. John cannot speak of heavenly things, but Christ can. John is limited, but Jesus is not. In verse 32, when he says what he has seen and heard, he testifies. Uh, that simply speaks of the fact that Jesus is an eyewitness. And even though Jesus is an eyewitness, many disregarded his testimony. But it says in verse 33, he who receives, received his testimony has certified that God is true. So when it says he who has received his testimony, it's speaking of a one time for all time decision of the will to receive. He's saying Jesus is delivering the absolute truth and those who receive it believe God because God is truthful. So they receive that. In verse 34, for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the spirit by measure. So many prophets were sent by God to speak his words to a lost and dying world. And each of these prophets was anointed for their task. They had what is referred to as a measure of the spirit. But in the case of Jesus, there was no limit to the work of the spirit in him. Remember, as we've been in Colossians in chapter 1, verse 19, remember how Paul said, it pleased the Father that in Jesus, in him, all the fullness should dwell. Then he goes on in verse 35, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. The Father loves the Son, loves him beyond the most faithful servants. The Father loves the Son much more than he loved John the Baptist. And his affection was much different than the affection that God had for the others. His affection for Jesus was different. Jesus' father made him the greatest prophet, the greatest priest, and the greatest, greatest king. He made him the greatest judge because all things, including judgment, are his. All things are in his hand. When we get to chapter 5, verse 27, we will read, the Father has given him authority to execute judgment also because he's the Son of Man. So the prophets had various gifts. They performed miracles. They received visions and dreams. They had revelation of the future, yet none possessed all the spiritual gifts. Jesus alone has all power. And then in verse 36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And we'll look at this for a moment and close. When it says he who believes, the word believe is a Greek word. It, 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 it speaks of faith that has been deposited in Jesus Christ. 
And when your faith has been deposited in Jesus Christ, in other words, like he had earlier said in chapter 3, when you've been born again, when the Holy Spirit of God has come to dwell within you, when you turned from your sin and confessed your need for God and asked for forgiveness and repented, and you trusted in Jesus, he came and dwelt within you. You became the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. Your name is now written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you're sealed by the Spirit into the day of redemption. When you became a believer, your eternal life became a present tense possession. You have it now. You have it now. If you're born again, you have everlasting life now. It's not something you're awaiting. It's something you're already possessing. You're already walking in life. That's part of what it means to grow in your knowledge and understanding of the ways of the Lord because there's so much that God has already given to us that we, we sometimes fail to realize. He's already, he's already poured out all his amazing blessings on us. We just, we just don't understand that, that God has given to us so much. We're, 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 we're like children who are playing next to a water hydrant that we turned on during the summer and we're splashing around with the water because we can't even visualize within our mind how beautiful it would be to be able to be on a, a Hawaiian beach. So we play in the gutter. We, we, you know, it's enough water to make me cool and it's fun and my friends are with me, but, but God says, but I have something greater than that. Don't you understand? No, you know, this water's fun. No, no, I, I've got something greater than that. It's yours and it's in Christ. You have it. It's everlasting life. It's abundant life. It's age-abiding life. It's, it's a life that, that God will never leave you, never forsake you. God will provide for you. God is with you. He, he doesn't abandon you. It's, he, he's, he's there through your trials. He's there through your pains. He's there in your joys. He's there for no matter what. When your friends forsake you, when your mom and your dad have nothing to do with you, he, he lifts you up, and you understand that, and you go through one thing after another, but you're never feeling alone because he's with you. That's, 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 that's a Christian who is growing. I, I heard about a guy who was in the military and he was sending his, this is in World War II, he was sending his mom uh, cashier's checks. He would, he would cash his um, paycheck and he'd get a cashier's check and he would send it home. And he did that for all the months that he was serving. And so he served for several years, and he finally got out of the, the army. And when he came home, he, he hadn't been home. He, he came home, and as he walked up the sidewalk towards his mom's house, the little fence she had in the front was rickety. It was falling apart. When he opened up the gate, it almost came off the hinge. It needed painting. The, the grass was dead, and there were weeds, and, and the plants were overgrown. He walked up to the wooden porch, and it was creaking. It almost gave way under his weight. He gets this, the screen door, opens it up. The screen is falling out, and he opens the door, and he, Mom, I'm home. And she, oh, son, it's so good to see you. And Mom, what happened to the house? Well, honey, I didn't have the money to keep the house up. I had barely enough just to survive. What do you mean? What do you mean? Ma honey, I didn't have any money. Yes, you did, Mama. Every month I sent you cashier check. She said, cashier's check? What is that? He said, you don't know what a cashier's check is? She goes, no. What did you do with those pieces of paper that I sent you? Oh, she takes them into a room, and she had used those checks as wallpaper. <laughs> the whole room was wallpapered with cashier's checks. Is, is your life like that? Filled with uncashed checks where God has said, no, I told you I'll provide for you. No, no, you won't. You, you don't. I told you I'd be. No, no, you first. A lot of believers have yet to understand that we have life in Christ. There's nothing you go through and nothing that is so deep that God isn't with you and that God isn't deeper still. Nothing. You are never alone. He doesn't forsake you. He doesn't abandon you. He walks beside you. He carries you through because he loves you. And all the enemy has to do 
his whisper in your ear. He doesn't care about you just once. How does he do that? A lot of times through friends. A lot of times through people you hang around with. Sometimes, many times really, through a professor in school or some unbelieving neighbor or a relative. And they'll just, ah, you and your God, you and your, how come? And before you know it, you're just filled with all these doubts. And if God was so good, how come? And before you know it, because you don't feel that you have any answers, you stop believing, you stop trusting. Or you start thinking, yeah, he blesses other people. It's just me he won't bless. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that my God shall provide all my need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. That God is with me. And though all may forsake me, yet he never will. And he provides for me. And he loves me. And that's what you need to understand. And when Jesus, rather John is speaking here in verse 36, when he says, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, that is something you presently have. But it says, he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. Well, what do you have if you don't believe in Jesus? The wrath of God. The wrath of God abides on you. The wrath of God continually abides on those who reject him. Psalm 7, verse 11, God is a just judge. God is angry with the wicked every day. In Romans 2, 4 through 6, Paul said, Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. So it's very clear. If you believe in the Son, you have everlasting life. If you don't, the wrath of God abides on you. As for myself, I believe. I gave my heart to Christ. He washed me of my sins. He gave me a new life. Before, his wrath was on me. Now, his smile is on me. It's up to you.